Um, today, we are going to talk about predictions, making predictions from models, and then visualizing the results. Okay, so like always, this will be pretty interactive. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we'll get through all the slides, but uh, I, I never know how much how long this stuff is going to take. So I do have 98 slides, as Brock said, or no, 101, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, if we don't get through them all, then we don't get through them all. But um, I don't know how long this stuff is going to take. So here we go. All right, so we're going to talk about fitting some basic models with R with LME4. And then we're going to use those models to create some different plots. So we'll start out with coefficient plots, which are probably among the easiest things to predict or to produce, but they're also probably among the least useful, in my opinion. Um, we'll then talk about using coefficients from the model to make predictions by hand and not like literally by hand, but we're going to use the predictions to, um, to actually come up with, we're gonna use the coefficients to come up with predictions for specific cases in the data. And then we're gonna make sure that what we come up with matches what we get from predict, which is the automatic method of doing it. Okay, then we're gonna talk about using the predict function on new data. So data that's not in your data set. And that's really helpful for plots. And then finally, we'll talk about marginal effects a little bit. Um, that one's going to be uh, a little bit less emphasis on that, but it is um, actually, I think a super important topic. And I'll talk about a package that will do this for you sort of automatically, but I also wanna go through doing it yourself with the predict function because that tends to be how I do it most of the time because I want full control over everything, all right? So learning objectives, understand how to pull different pieces out of the model, that's part of it. Um, how do you get the random effects out? How do you get the coefficients, the fixed effects coefficients out, things like that, okay? Um, understand how multi-level models make their predictions for specific observations and specifically, um, I'm assuming you all feel comfortable with that from a multiple regression, single level model framework. So we're gonna focus mostly on how is it different from a, for a multi-level model versus standard regression, okay? And then be able to use output from the model to visualize different parts of the model, okay? So we're gonna read in the data to start. So I'm gonna give you two minutes. Um, go ahead and read in the popularity data if you have cloned the repo, it should be in the data folder. If not, um, that, that file is on Canvas. So go ahead and grab that file from Canvas, if not, and uh, read that in. So I'm gonna ask you to try first, and then I'll show you the code to do that.
Okay, hopefully you were able to be successful there. This is the code that I wrote, and your code will probably look almost identical, if not exactly identical. Um, so assuming you're using an RStudio project and you have opened this, opened an R Markdown file or an R script in that project, uh, then you would probably have either the data right at the root level of that project, or maybe you have a data folder. Okay, I happen to have a data folder. And so that's why I'm my call here is saying, here, here, data, go into the data folder from the root directory of that RStudio project, and then read in popularity.csv, okay? So I'm loading the tidyverse here because I'm, I know I'm gonna use the tidyverse for a bunch of other stuff, and I'm using read underscore CSV as opposed to read.csv because then that will read in a tibble, which just has nicer printing properties and a few other things, okay? So then the data set looks like this. Any questions on that? Okay. Now I'm gonna ask you to fit some basic models. So fit each of the following models with popular as the outcome with a random intercept for class, popular as the outcome with sex included as a fixed effect and a random intercept for class. And then popular as the outcome with sex included as a fixed effect and a random intercept and slope for class. Okay, so go ahead and try that. Um, if you get all of those done, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. If I see thumbs up from everybody and we still have time left, then I will move on if we need less than four minutes. About one more minute.
All right. So hopefully you all made it through. Um, I saw a thumbs up from quite a few of you, but not all of you. But um, if not, that's OK. You can just pause what you're doing right now and go ahead and just copy this code. OK. But this is what I was expecting. So the first, we're loading the LME4 library, right? And then I'm again, my convention is to use zero to de denote the unconditional model and then just sort of index them from there. So I start out with M0 and I'm saying popular is the outcome, linear mixed effects regression. Popular is the outcome, it's modeled by an intercept, right? Plus that intercept randomly varying across class, okay? And the data set is popular. For the second one, I asked you to add sex as a fixed effect. So that just goes here. We could say one plus sex if we wanted to, but um, it's implied unless we omit it explicitly. And then for the random slope, we just say sex plus, and then we have sex here inside the random effects portion as well. Okay. And again, this is now having the intercept and the sex slope randomly vary. You could have one plus sex there, and that would be great too. Um, but again, it is implied. Okay. So those are the models. So one more task before we really get started. Um, use whatever test you'd like and come up with a model that you think fits the data best. Okay. So we've got three models that we're trying to compare. What I'd like you to do is do whatever you think is best and try to come try to make a decision on which of these three models you think displays the best fit to the data. Okay? And when you feel confident, go ahead and give me a thumbs up emoji so I know um, on timing if we should move forward before the timer runs out.
Okay, about 30 more seconds. Okay, here we go. So I started out by using the performance package and saying compare performance. So compare performance across M0, M1, and M2. This print MD just makes it look nicer on the slides. I really don't care about most of this other stuff over here. What I mostly care about is AIC and BIC. Okay, and again, remember lower values are better. And really any difference above like 10 is a pretty substantial difference. Um, differences that are within like three points are essentially equivalent fitting models and between five and 10 ish, um, are, you know, moderate evidence for one model over the other, but that's all just sort of rule of thumb guidelines stuff. Okay. But when we're looking across here, we see there's a big drop in both AIC and BIC from M0 to M1. So that's good. Um, but then there's really not much of a drop in AIC going here, and there's actually an increase in BIC. So this gives me pretty good evidence that M1 is preferred over M2 because M2 is probably, we're estimating a lot more parameters there, right? Because we have the random intercept and the random slope and the correlation between them. And so we're estimating not just a, a different starting point for every class, but also every the relationship between sex and the outcome, whatever it is, I can't remember now, um, that slope is going to change for every single class also, okay? So that's a lot of additional parameters and this is giving us some evidence that that's probably not worth it, okay? Another thing we could do is use a test of the log likelihood. So here I'm comparing model zero to model one. You could actually include all three models. I always like to just compare two at a time because it makes it really clear what you're comparing. All right, so here's M0 to M1. We get this very significant result, um, huge chi-square value. So basically this is saying the, the, re, the change in the li log likelihood is significant, okay? So that's evidence that M1 is fitting the model better or fitting the data better than M0. And then here we compare M1 to M2 and you can see the chi-square value is a lot smaller and the P is above 0.05. Um, I've mentioned a couple times, right, that I'm not a huge fan of like really hardcore decisions with p-values in particular, but this is just now another source of evidence. I would rely on AIC and BIC more, but if you have AIC and BIC both telling you the same thing and the test of the log likelihood is also telling you the same thing, then that's pretty good evidence for that conclusion, right? So here across these three different tests that we've done, we have pretty good evidence that M1 is has the best fit to the data. So M2 might be slightly overfitting to the data. Okay. All right. Moving hey, on. Yep. Um, I've seen people use the ANOVA call for that same thing that you just did with the log likelihood test. And that's what I did. And I'm I got the gist of what you got from that, but different results. Is one of these using a method that is less uh, supported then or like less um, I don't know. It should whatever. be identical. Are you talking they're about not identical, one? but they're really close. I mean, it's like your chi squared. No, no. If you go to the next one, one. yeah, your chi squared on the second model is five point oh two, and I have like four point seven eight. I mean, very close. But right. um, I wonder if in a more complex model it would be more different, and we should trust one over the other. I would trust Anova over this one. That's interesting. I thought for sure they were identical, so I will go and look into that more. Um, I'm two, sorry. To okay, you. interesting. Yeah, I'm mostly using this uh, just because it prints to the slides nicer. What were you going to say, Lindsay? No, just that I did the same thing as Chris using ANOVA and got the same result for the chi square value. And very same result of Chris? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I will look into that more. Um, ANOVA would be what I would trust. I wonder. Yeah, they must be 
testing something slightly different. Um, so I'll look into that and try to get back to you. Could it, awesome. is it Thank that you. you add all three in the same, like for ANOVA, if you just say M0, 1, and 2 in the same line, like would that potentially be you're adding a, another comparator? So I don't think so, because I, I think when you do three models like that, it's going to compare the first to the second and then the second to the third. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know, when did you both do ANOVA and then do M0, M1, M2 all in the same thing? Mm -hmm. I did pairs. That's cool that you can do all three. I didn't even know you could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I'm not sure what's going on there. I would have expected them to be identical. So I will look into that more. But I would trust Inova. Anyway, the overall take home message should still be basically the same though. Right. This is close though. So was it was yours significant? Like less than no, it was P point oh nine. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the p-value is actually the same. So they are clearly doing something different. All right, so I'll have to look into that more. Okay, any other questions on any of that or, or clarifying thoughts? Okay, so moving on to coefficient plots. Um, so this is the first now uh, visualization sort of stuff that we're gonna be doing here, okay? There's lots of different ways to do this, um, but there's sort of two that I would recommend. So you could obviously do it by hand, but there's two packages um, that will be very helpful for pulling out model results. One is the parameters package, which actually is this part of that whole easy stats thing. Um, so you could use that and I'll illustrate how to do that in a minute. The other is broom.mixed and broom.mixed is basically just a spin-off package from broom, which you're probably familiar with, um, but it is a big package to basically tidy model results, okay, across a whole bunch of different types of models. And uh, the broom.mixed package started out as an idea, um, oh, thank you, Masaki, it says performance underscore LRT is identical or almost identical to ANOVA. So what did I do? Uh, test likelihood ratio. Okay. Daniel, okay. So can I ask what package that's in? Because I can't seem to pull the test likelihood from what this I is from performance, the performance package. That's weird. Okay. Yeah, it should be. If not, don't worry about it. We can come back to it later. Um, uh, what you did with the Nova is totally fine, but I will come back to that. Okay, so back to this. Um, so Broom is a big package for tidying model results generally, right? And Broom.mixed is specifically for mixed up mixed models. Okay, so like LME4, but it also does other other types of models. It's the author of this originally wrote this package as, with the idea of just incorporating it into Broom but it just became really complex. And so they, the authors of both packages just decided to keep them separate, okay? So broom.mixed is what I typically use um, and I will end up using that throughout the slides, but I'll show you how to use parameters also because you probably already have that one installed. And if you wanna just use that moving forward, you can as well, okay? So broom.mixed looks like this. We say library broom.mixed after you have it installed. And then you just say tidy M0, okay, and or M1 or M2. And what you'll get is this, this standardized output and it will always be the same. And it's always, com always comes out in the data frame. And then it has um, parameter, or essentially the estimated coefficients from the model, okay? And you can control some of this too, as I'll show in a little bit. But by default, it's going to give you the fixed effects. So the effect fixed, by default, if you just call it, it'll have fixed and then ran pars, right? And so it'll have multiple rows for every fixed effect that you have. And then ran pars is just gonna be your standard deviations of your random effects and potentially um, the correlation of those random effects, okay? So for this model, it's really simple. All we have is one fixed effect, which is our intercept. And then we have the standard deviation of that intercept. So you can see term, standard deviation of an intercept, right, for the class. So if we had multiple levels, we would have different groups over here. 
and then the standard deviation of the residual, which is there, okay? If we wanted just the fixed effects, you can call it like this, effects equals fix. You could also say effects equals randpars if that's what you want, okay? Uh, very often though, we wanna do things across multiple models. So in this case, we have those three models. Let's go ahead and tidy all three models. And at the same time, we're gonna add in a 95% confidence interval, okay? So this is how I would do this. I'm using this function bind rows, which is going to bind rows of data frames. So we have one data frame here and another data frame here. Bind rows is just gonna staple them together, okay? So I'm saying bind rows and then in here, I'm, I end up feeding it three different models. Okay, so I'm saying tidy M0, give me just the fixed effects, and then give me the confidence interval as well. Conf.int equals true. Okay, and I'm doing that for M0, M1, M2. And then at the end here, I just have this dot ID argument. Okay, that dot ID argument is going to give me a new column that just indexes these things one to n, okay? So that you can keep track of which is which. So this one would be indexed one, this one would be two, and this one would be three. So all the rows of that one would stick, stay with there, okay? Then because of my own naming conventions, I named them model zero, model M0, M1, M2. I'm now modifying that model column that I created here. I'm making it numeric, and then I'm subtracting one. So now I have this column here called model where the numbers actually correspond to my naming conventions M0, M1, M2, okay? And now I have all the fixed effects for this model, okay? From there, we can plot it just like we would any other data frame, okay? So, there's again lots of ways we can do this but i'm doing this like this i'm creating this object called pd for position dodge and i'm setting it at 0.5 the reason i'm doing this is because these plots or these points will by default all be on the same line that intercept line and so i want to sort of dodge them out a little bit so they're not all overlapping okay so then i'm going to call ggplot i'm going to plot my models data frame. I'm going to put estimate on the x-axis and term on the y-axis. So if we go back to our data set, it looks like this, right? Estimate goes on the x-axis. Term, either intercept or sex girl, goes on the y-axis, okay? And then I'm going to have the color be equal to the model, okay? Notice I'm calling factor on this, though, because it's a number, and I want this to be a categorical I want it to think of it as categorical, okay? So then I get factor model. That means I get three separate points for these things, okay? Then we say geom error bar H. So we have geom error bar and geom error bar H. Geom error bar H just means horizontal error bars instead of vertical, right? And then we say the min is equal to conf.low. So if you're thinking about the confidence interval, right, or the, the error bar, we want the lower bound of that to be equal to this value on conf.low, and the upper bound of that to be equal to this value on conf.high, okay? So that's what I'm saying here, x min is equal to conf.low, x max is equal to conf.high, those are columns in my data set, which I got by saying conf.int equals true. And then this position is going to be equal to PD, which I created up here, and then height equals 0.2, that's just gonna make the whiskers a little bit smaller. And then I add the points on top of that. And I say position equals PD to make sure that they're matched up with their um, error bars. Okay, so that's a little bit complicated, but the thing that is nice about this is if you're tidying the code like this, or even for a single model, this code will always work, okay? So that's what's really nice about broom.mix. It doesn't matter what your model looks like. It will always output a data frame that is in a standardized format. So you can expect it to look like it does. 
and then this code will always always work on that data frame okay so it's a really nice way to go from a model result to some standardized output to a plot okay and what we're doing here is just looking at, at how the intercept in this case changes across models so for model zero it's up here and then for model one and two that they're, they're basically identical okay sex girl was only in model one and two right and that is here when it says sex girl right the thing that we actually modeled was sex but it only had two levels which were boy and girl so this is the coefficient when sex equals girl okay questions on that so this is just a reiteration of what i just said it's a standardized output so the previous code will always work regardless of your model bit of a caveat though i actually don't think that prior plot is all that useful this is fairly common to see things like this um, but I don't think it's the most useful thing out there. Um, specifically, if you just have a table of coefficients, you're getting basically the same information, but visually. Okay. Um, very often, you might want to compare coefficients across models, but if you're doing that, you might have to omit the intercept because sometimes the intercept can vary wildly across models, especially if you're doing things like centering and not centering or whatever. You also should be careful about scales. Okay. So if you're producing a, a plot like this and you have um one coefficient that's on a really big scale say zero to 100 and then a different one that's on a scale of zero to one then that's obviously going to impact the coefficients and then things are going to be spread out really far on your plot and it's going to be hard to make actual meaningful comparisons so be careful about scales if you were to say okay i i like this plot and i want to include that in a publication i think there's a lot of things that you should do before doing that for instance paying closer attention to the color and not having things like factor model. And these models should probably, instead of saying zero, one, two, should probably have meaningful names, okay? Um, like unconditional, uh, conditional with sex, and then conditional with sex and random intercept or, or random slope or something like that, okay? But it's at least a, a place to get started, okay? If we wanted to replicate the same thing with the parameters package, it would just look like this. So we load the parameters library, and then we say parameters m0, pipe that to as underscore tibble, and then you get something that looks like this, okay? So then we can do that same bind rows, but I'm just calling as tibble parameters on here. Notice it gives you the confidence interval by default, so you're good there. And then the rest of that code is the same. And then here I reproduce the plot and all I have to do is just change a few of the actual um, column names. Okay, so coefficient with a capital C, parameter, and then CI underscore low, CI underscore high. Right? Those things are a little bit different, but otherwise the rest of it is the exact same. Okay, so you are welcome to use either of those packages that works for you and that um, you are happy with. I'm, I have no, real strong feeling about one or the other, but I will typically use broom.mixed, okay? Okay, other parts of the model. Um, as I mentioned, I'm gonna use broom.mixed from here on out, but you should be able to do this with other ones too. Okay, variance components. By default, the variance components, when I say tidy M0, we don't get a standard error on those things, okay? And so what we can do is we can compute confidence intervals for those variance components by using either profiled or bootstrap confidence intervals, okay, which we talked about a little bit last time. This is how we would do this. I'm going to say tidy M0. The effect I want is just the RAND parse, so I'm not worried about the fixed effects in this case. Give me a confidence interval. And then for the method for the confidence interval, use boot, okay? And that's going to give me bootstrap confidence intervals. You can, I'm pretty sure, pass additional arguments here too, like probably in sim, um, which would be the number of bootstrap samples. By default, I think it's 500, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so you probably want to look into that if you are going to actually report these results. 
But then you get something like this, right? Here's the point estimate, and then you have lower and upper bounds of that point estimate from bootstrap resampling, okay? And then you could use that for um, plotting if you wanted to, okay? I'm doing this again with M2. And what the reason I'm showing this is a couple of things. A, this one actually takes a little bit of time to run because the model is a bit more complicated. And this is overall still a really simple model, okay? So when you start to build up towards these much more complicated models, this might take a considerable amount of time, okay? I also get these messages down here, okay? So I have 29 messages where I got a singular fit and I have four warnings where the model failed to converge, okay? Um, as I mentioned before, I would not generally worry about this too much if you're doing bootstrap resampling because this sort of thing can happen when you're fitting on a new sample, right? So you're fitting on a bootstrap resample of your data. And so it might happen occasionally. But overall, if I have what I believe is 500 bootstrap resamples and 29 of them have singular fits and four of them have convergence warnings, I'm probably not gonna be too concerned about it. If I had 400 warnings, then I would be a lot more concerned about it, okay? Um, so uh, we'll talk about this later, but there are things that you can do about this as well, like changing the optimizer or whatever. Um, but then the other thing I wanted to point out down here is that we get uh, bootstrap confidence intervals and they're, it's very small and cut off, but we get those not just for the, the random effects, but also for the correlations, okay? So we have, these for the standard deviations of the random effects, as well as the correlations, okay? And so you can see the lower bound of this correlation goes to negative one, but the upper bound is still negative. So we have pretty good confidence that the correlation is actually negative. We just don't really have a lot of confidence in where or how much. Okay, um, so quick challenge. Um, I have six minutes here, but I'm not gonna give you that much time. Um, try to produce a dot plot like we just did for the um, for the fixed effects, but now using the random effects like this, okay? And using the uncertainty that way, okay? So I'm gonna give you half the time I actually have here. I'm gonna give you three minutes. Um, if you get part of the way there, great. If you get none of the way there, that's okay too.
All right. Hopefully you got at least part of the way there. If not, that's okay. Um, this is one way to do it. Okay. And there's, again, there's a lot of different ways we could do this. But what I've done is rather than just copying and pasting this code three times within bind rows, which would absolutely work, I instead decided to put this all in a function. Okay. So I'm creating a function here called poll model results, which is defined as a function, which takes one argument model. Okay. Then within here, I'm taking the tidy code that I had on the previous slide and I'm just saying model, any generic model. It could be any model, right? Any um, LME4 model. And then I can say poll model results on M0 and it'll just basically run this tidy code with these additional arguments. Okay. And so I'm saying bind rows, poll model results for M0, M1, M2, ID equals model. I get all of the, these messages. But now I can do something like this, okay? So I'm saying full models, which is the object I created on the previous slide, estimate on the x-axis, term on the y-axis, color equals factor model, plus geomar error bar h, right? So all of this is exactly the same, basically. The only difference here is now I'm saying facet wrap by effect, okay? So if we go, uh, let's look back here. Uh, yeah, effect, ran parse. Um, now I have the fixed effects and the random parameters. Okay, I asked you to just do the random parameters, but um, but this gives you both, okay? And then I have this scales equals free y, that makes uh, these able to be different, okay? Because by default, it's gonna try to have them be the same. So the y-axis on this plot is different from the y-axis on this plot. But the x-axis is scaled to be the same across both of them. And then I just put the legend on the bottom. Okay. Does that sort of make sense? Again, my point here is really not to teach you ggplot. My hope is that you have some familiarity with it coming into this. My point is really to get you to uh, see how you could pull the data out and then something you might do with it with ggplot. Okay, just from the coefficients. Daniel, can you say what um, position PD? I know position identity, but PD is some padding or something? Yeah, so that comes from back here. I have this object I've created called PD, which is position dodge. Oh, okay, dodge. Thank you. Yeah, so that's just making them not all be on the same line. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. All right, this is a um, random pop quiz that I'm going to ask you. Let's look at this output right here, right? So I'm saying tidy M0 effect equals ran vowels, okay? And look at these estimates here and, and what my group is and the level, okay? So th think about that. And then look at this same thing over here when I say ran coefs and see the estimate group level. Okay, so I'm gonna flip back and forth between those. What do you think the difference is between those? They are highly related. Any ideas? Okay, the answer is ran vowels. So when we're estimating a model, right, we estimate the fixed effects and then the random effects are assumed generated from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and some standard deviation, okay? Or another way of conceptualizing it is it is um, estimated from a normal distribution with a mean equal to the fixed effect, all right? And then some variance component. So ran vowels, are from this. They are centered around zero, okay? So let's go back here. If we look at this, we have positives and negatives, but they are centered around zero, okay? In this case, we have essentially just added in the intercept. So we've added the fixed effect to these ran vowels. So what this is, is essentially our prediction 
for that class, okay? So remember M0 just has a fixed effect intercept and then random variation of that intercept, okay? So basically what this is, is we have an estimate for our intercept of like 5.2 or whatever, right? These are the estimated differences between our fixed effect and what we're estimating for that given class, okay? So we're saying the average score or whatever in this class is about 0.9 points less than the overall average, our fixed effect intercept, okay? The overall average in this class is about 0.33 points higher than the fixed effect, okay, than the, the intercept. And we can confirm this by actually pulling out pieces of the model, okay? So here I'm saying tidy M0, M0 affect RAND vowels. So RAND vowels, right? That's those ones that are centered around zero. And I'm pulling just the intercept or just the estimate column. Come on, come on. Okay, so just pulling these columns. And then I'm saying, give me just the first five values. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that gives me those five values. Then I'm saying add, add to those five values the fixed effect, the first fixed effect from M0, which is just our intercept, okay? And we get these values. If I do the same thing for RAND COFs, you can see the values are exactly the same. So these two things are exactly the same. The only difference is that RAND COFs already have that intercept added into them, okay? So this is part of... Um, I mentioned, I think, the first day of class that, like, this class for the first at roughly half of the term is really about trying to get you to think deeper about these models. This is an, is an example, okay? When you have, when you're estimating a multi-level model, you have fixed effects, and then you have random variation around those fixed effects, okay? That random variation around the fixed effects is what, what, broom.mixed is calling rand vowels, okay? The rand coefs are essentially the mode of the conditional di distribution, but essentially it's just adding in the fixed effect, the corresponding fixed effect, okay? And this is true for um, random intercepts, which are the easiest to think about, or random slopes, okay? So in model two, we allowed not only the intercept to vary across classrooms, but we also allowed there to be a different relation between sex and score for every classroom. So we have an estimate for sex, which let's say is 0.5, right? The random vowels, the random vowels for, for a given class might be negative 0.2, right? That would mean for that classroom, the ran co the ran coef would be 0.5 minus 0.2, which is 0.3. Does that make sense? So then we would be saying this is our estimated slope essentially for that classroom. The random rand vowels are, are very useful for plotting um, and you can, they can be used to see um, sort of the, the random variation that you have in across units of whatever you're looking at. So here's an example where I'm saying M0 rand vowels, tidy M0, where the effect is equal to rand vowel, give me the confidence interval. Okay, that gives me the data frame. And then I'm plotting this where I'm using geom error bar and then geom point. And then I put geom H line at zero, just to say this is like the average, right? This is essentially the fixed effect. This is the deviation from the fixed effect. But this, as I say here, is not super helpful, which goes against what I just said a second ago, that these are very useful for plotting. They are, but not like this, right? This is hard to tell which classroom is which, and you can see you've got some variation, but it's not terrifically helpful. Quite a lot more helpful, though, is to just go ahead and take level and reorder it according to the estimate, okay? The rest of this is the same, and then we end up with something that looks like this. Okay, and so what we have here is this classroom, and you could still clean this up more, right? These, um, this x-axis is not really viewable. Um, 
but this is the lowest estimated intercept for classroom, right? And this is the highest, and then they're just ordered in that, that way. You can also look at the confidence intervals relative to this pink line at zero, right? To see which ones are significant at the 0.05 level, um, significantly different from the fixed effect there. Okay, does that make sense? So this code hopefully is relatively familiar at this point. It's pretty much the same, this part is pretty much the same thing that we've done a couple of times now, right? Um, but then this part, this geom H line is just saying Y intercept, put a horizontal line at zero. Okay, and then these are just some additional styling arguments. So make it a little bit thicker and make it ma magenta color. Questions on that? Is it clear why this plot might be actually helpful? So if you produce something like this and every single confidence interval minus maybe one or two is crossing that horizontal line, then that's evidence you don't really have a ton of variation. Here, the ma majority actually are not crossing that horizontal line. So that means we have quite a bit of variation. Okay, so wrapping up on coefficient plots, and then we'll move on to more exciting stuff, I think. Um, coefficient plots are generally pretty easy to produce, but they're often not the most informative. I think the random effects plots that we just looked at are more informative than the fixed effects plots, um, because very typically you have a lot of levels of a random effect, and so it's easier to look at them visually through a plot than it is through a table, right? But for the fixed effects, most of the time you can just look at tables and it's not gonna be a huge gain. Um, you can also, of course, make all of the plots that we've looked at so far a lot more fancy and a lot more you know, accessible and publication ready, but that's not really what we're focused on here today. We're just focused on exploring our models. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break, um, get up and stretch and we will come back talking about making predictions by hand. I am essentially positive we're not going to get through all the slides today, but that's okay. All right.
Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. So we're going to talk about making predictions by hand, by hand, not not really by hand, but um, pulling results from the model and then using code to calculate it, uh, as I sort of just did by adding the fixed effect thing. Okay, and the point of this is really to um, get you hopefully to understand. Um, the difference between like a standard single level regression model and how it makes its predictions versus a multi level model. Okay. So, reminder of what our raw data look like, right? Let's think back to standard regression for a second. So, notice I'm using LM here instead of LMER, right? So, this is just from the base stats package. And I'm fitting a model with popular as the outcome and intercept and sex, okay? Intercept and sex are predicting popular, all right? So in this case, our estimated model looks like this, right? We're going to say our prediction for the popularity of a person is going to be equal to our intercept, which we estimate at 4.28, plus the coefficient for sex girl, which is 1.57. So if they are um, coded in the data set as girl, then we add 1.57 to this 4.28. If not, then we just predict 4.28, okay? So let's make a prediction for the first student, okay? Here's the first student. This student is a girl, okay? It's coded as a girl. So we could do something like this. We could say cofm, which is gonna give us a vector of length two in return, but I'm gonna, grab just the first one, which is the intercept. Then I'm going to add to that the coefficient for M2, or the second coefficient. And then I'm gonna multiply that by whether or not pupil one sex is equal equal to girl, okay? And so uh, pupil one is just this, this data frame of length one, okay? And so this is actually going to just return true which gets coerced to one. So we're multiplying this coefficient by one to say, yeah, add it in there basically. And we get 5.85, OK? 
Okay. We can also use predict on M. And by default, it'll predict all the rows of the data set that we use to estimate the model. So I'm saying, just give me the prediction for the first row of the data set. And I get 5.853314. So they, they look identical. Okay. That's pretty clear, right? That should be completely review. With the multi-level model, we're going to be doing a similar sort of thing. Uh, what am I doing here? Predict M2. Okay. So for M2, which is our model that has the estimated uh, random variation across the intercept and the slope, we're going to do something slightly different. So rather than going through this, um, I'm just going to keep talking. Okay. And you can follow along if you want, and I would encourage you to. But if I make the prediction from M2 for that same student, right, the first row of the data set, I get 5.73 as opposed to 5.85. So of course we wouldn't expect those predictions to be the same because they're different models. But what exactly is going into this prediction to make that 5.73 instead of 5.85, okay? When we have a model, that has a random intercept and a random slope, essentially, we're just going to add those, the random variation for those things into our prediction, okay? So this means for an individual student, our prediction for that student is made up by the overall intercept plus the overall slope plus, in this case, the offset for the classroom intercept. So that's that variation around zero, right? So it's the difference of the classroom intercept from the overall intercept plus the classroom slope offset. So the difference in the slope for sex for that classroom as opposed to the um, overall. Okay, does that make sense? So then our actual prediction will look like this okay here's our first row of the data set and we're going to extract the random values as we did before right but i'm doing it just for um so i'm getting all of them but then then i'm saying just for class one okay where group is equal to class and level is equal to equal to one all right and that's because i want to predict this data set Okay, so class is one. Okay, so now I get these estimates. So the intercept for class one is 0.02. That's the intercept offset, what I've called the offset, right? And for sex girl is negative 0.04. Okay, so to make our prediction, we're going to pull the fixed effects out, which I've used this fix F1, and we get this intercept and this coefficient for sex. Okay. So we have our overall intercept, 4.39, plus our overall slope, 1.35, times whether the data was coded as girl or not, right? Plus the random inter or the, the classroom deviation from the intercept, right? Plus the classroom deviation for the slope. Okay. And then we end up with 5.73, which we can confirm, we actually already did this, but we can confirm that that is indeed what we get back from predict, okay? So when you're fitting a multi-level model, you are saying, okay, a student's score is not just a function of their own data, it's also a function of the things that they're nested in. So if they're nested in the classroom, then you're estimating random deviations across the classroom, and you need to add that into the prediction. So you're saying, on average, students in this classroom score five points higher. So then you need to add that five points for everyone in that classroom. And in this classroom, on students, on average, students score three points lower. So you're going to subtract three from everybody's predicted score in that classroom. Okay. And this case is a little bit more complicated because we have not just a random intercept, but also a random slope. So we're saying the variation or the relation between sex and popularity is different across classrooms. 
Okay, and so whatever that difference is, you need to add that in also. Okay, so without using predict, try to do this on your own now. So predict a score for a boy in classroom 10 from M2, okay? So back here, we did this for a girl in classroom one, right, classroom one. Try to do the same thing for a boy in classroom 10, okay? Probably not gonna give you a full five minutes here. I'll give you more like three minutes. Let's go like 20 more seconds ish. Okay, so this is in some ways easier than it seems and in some ways it's still fairly difficult right but i would encourage you if you were not successful in this to to keep working at it and try again with different combinations because in my experience anyway going through this really helped me understand like what actually is happening in the model okay so um we're going to take the class 10 randvals right um, for M2. So I'm filtering where group is equal to class and level is equal to, equal to 10. But then when I'm making my prediction, I'm using the first fixed effect, which is the intercept, right? And then I'm adding that to the intercept deviation for classroom 10. But I don't have to worry about slope at all because the slope is not included in the prediction because it's only there if sex equals girl. Okay, and in this case, sex equals boy. So I don't have to add in the slope for the student based on the, the 4.29 or whatever it was. And I don't have to worry about the classroom deviation for the slope either. Okay, because both of those, we would just be multiplying them by zero anyway. Okay, so I can confirm with predict. This is one way to do it. There's many ways to do this. But as I mentioned before, um, predict will, by default, make predictions for all the rows of the data frame that you fit the model to, okay? So what you can do very easily is take popular or what it, the data set that you use to fit a model and pass that to mutate and create a new column called pred or whatever you want to call it, which is equal to the predictions from your model, okay? And that'll give you a prediction for every row in your data set. Then from there, you can just filter it to the values you want. So class equals 10 and sex equals boy. So we get 4.675822, 4.675822. Okay, that makes, makes sense. So when you have a random slope, especially on a uh, categorical variable, you're only adding in 
the random slope variation when that categorical variable comes into play. All right, more on the predict function. We will probably end up using the predict function a lot throughout this class. Um, I like it a lot. I think it's a really good way to understand models and to uh, do different things with your model results to understand them, okay? Once you have the model parameters, you can use predict for any values on those parameters, okay? Any values you want, whether those values are in your data or not. Okay, so let's fit a slightly more complicated model and use using a different longitudinal file than what you are using or what you're using in the homework. Okay, and we'll do this through the Equationomatic package, which hopefully you all have installed. It's my package. Um, and then just say head sim longitudinal, sim underscore longitudinal. You don't have to use head if you don't want to, but that'll give you the first six rows of this data frame. Okay. This data frame does look a lot like the one that I've asked or that we're using for the homework, but it's a little bit different. Okay, it's it's different simulated data. All right. Okay, now model. You try first. Fit a model with wave and treatment as predictors of students' score, and allow the intercept and the relation between wave and score to vary by student. Okay. Two minutes. Go ahead. About 30 more seconds. Okay, hopefully you got through. If not, this is the code, all right? So go ahead and just copy this code and bring it over, okay? What we're gonna do here is I'm, I'm creating the object called M for our model, linear mixed effects regression, score is the outcome. That's modeled by an intercept, which is implied because I could say one plus, but I'm not here, I'm just leaving it out. Wave plus treatment, right? So these are the two predictors of score fixed effects predictors. And then I'm saying plus, and then here's where I'm defining my random effects, right? I'm having wave very randomly across student IDs. And again, the intercept is implied there. So it's one plus wave, and you could have both in there if you wanna be more explicit, okay? So the intercept and the wave slope are varying across SIDs. Okay, and then the data is equal to sim longitudinal. Questions on that? Okay. So we're gonna plot the predictions. Um, this data set, unfortunately, is grouped already. Um, so when we're gonna do this, we're gonna pipe this first to ungroup, all right, to ungroup it. 
And then we're going to limit our data to just the first three students. OK, so I'm going to say filter where SID is in this vector. OK, so it's going to look through that vector, one, two, three, and it's going to look through SID. And if SID is in that vector, one, two, three, then it will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. OK, and so this will then give us a data set that has just those three observations. OK, now try creating a new column in the data set with the model predictions for these three students. OK, and you're going to do this by saying by saying new data equals first three. OK. About 30 more seconds. OK, here we go. This is how I would have expected you to do it, right? We have first three, our data set that we just created. We're going to pipe that to mutate. And I'm going to create a new column here, which in this case, I'm calling model pred. All right? And that's going to be equal to predict from M where the new data is equal to first three, OK? In this case, we're actually, we have the data set here and we're piping it down into here. So we are kind of repeating ourselves on the data set here. So you could actually just put a dot there also, and that would take whatever the data set is that you piped into there. But if it's a little more explicit to just refer to first three there, and that works too. Okay, so it's kind of cut off here, but you can see I have a new column here for the model predictions. Okay, questions on that? All right, try creating a plot with a different facet for each SID. OK, so we have those three SIDs. I want a different facet for each SID. And I want you to show the observed trend, so the relation between wave and score for each SID. OK, so I want you to plot um, the observed points, right? And then try to put a line that is the model prediction. Does that make sense? So do the best you can. If you don't get it, that's fine. We'll walk through it. But see if you can create different plots for each student showing the observed data and the model prediction. I also am asking you to color the line by whether this student was in treatment group or not. But if you don't get that far, that's fine.
20 more seconds. Okay. Here's how I did it. All right. And you may have done it slightly differently and that's totally fine. I took first three and I'm piping that to mutate, create my model predictions. Then from there, I'm piping it straight into ggplot. Okay. So you could have stored this as your, as its own object and that's fine too. Okay. But I'm piping this straight into ggplot. Then I'm saying, okay, I want wave along the X axis. I want score along the y axis and I want them colored by treatment. Okay. So I want the points and the lines and everything colored by treatment. Then I'm going to add points, geom point. So score, right, is the observed score. So I'm saying I want score as my observed points. I want a line connecting those points. And then this part's where it gets a little tricky. I'm going to say plus geom line, but here I say, y equals model pred. So I'm redefining the y axis for this layer. Okay. So for the other layers, the y axis is defined here for score. But on for this geom line layer, the y axis is equal to the model prediction. Okay. And then I'm going to facet wrap by SID. So that part was a little bit tricky, but I would sort of hope that you would be able to get the rest of this even if you weren't able to get that part, okay? So then what we see is we have this line for this student, this line for this student, and you can compare sort of where the points are compared to the straight line, which is our model prediction, okay? Questions on that? Okay, the other thing we can do is we can make predictions outside of our data, okay? So I mentioned this before, but that new data argument will just allow you to specify whatever values you want for the variables that you have in the model, okay? Um, so student two has a, a, a lot lower intercept than student one or three, right? What would happen, what would we expect that student's trend would have looked like had that student been in the treatment group. Okay, that's what we're going to do now. So try to do the, make this prediction um, on your own. Okay, so basically, this is what the observed looks like. How are we going to create a prediction for that student had they have been in the treatment group. So instead of treatment equal to zero, treatment was equal to one. Okay. So go ahead and try to do that. If you're not successful again, that's okay. We'll go through it. But just see if you can do it. See if you can figure it out. Thirty more seconds.
Okay, so this is a little tricky, but here's how I would do it, okay? I'm creating an entirely new data frame here where I'm saying SID is equal to two, okay? Then wave I'm saying is equal to zero to nine and treatment is just equal to a factor with where the value equals one and the levels are zero and one, okay? Then when I say predict M on new data equals student to treat, we get something that looks like this, okay? So what we can do is we can take our sim longitudinal data, and I know this looks like a lot of code, but it's not, most of it is not really all that relevant, okay? So we take our sim longitudinal and we filter it just where SID equals two. Then on my mutate, I have my model prediction for what the student actually is. And here's where I'm using that dot, which is just saying the data that's piped into this, right? But I'm also having this treat pred where I'm saying predict M where the new data is student to treat, okay? And then from there, I'm piping that to ggplot wave score point line. And then I just have two lines, one where Y equals the model prediction and one where Y equals the treatment prediction, okay? And then I'm coloring this one, this fire brick. And then this annotation part is just to, um, well, you'll see in a second, okay? So what I get is something that looks like this, okay? So here's the observed trajectory. This black line is our model prediction for this student. And this red line is our prediction had that student been in the treatment group, okay? So, this might be a little surprising. This is negative, right? The treatment, this we're saying had the student been in the treatment group, they would have been even lower in their predictions than what they actually were. So is that right? Yes, it is. That's what we estimated. Okay, remember these are made up data, um, but in this case, treatment is estimated with on average a 1.54 difference in intercept, okay? And then for, and then that does vary between students with the standard deviation of 0.29, okay? So just in, interpreting this model really quick, this model says that students started on average with a score of about 98. That starting point, 98, varied between students with a standard deviation of about 9.74, okay? They progressed on average, they gained on average about 0.17 points per wave, okay? And we don't really know what wave represents here, but they gained about 0.17 points per wave on average, which varied between students with a standard deviation of 0.29, okay? The treatment effect though was only estimated on the intercept. So we do not have different slopes for treatments. And that was evident back here too. These lines are parallel, okay? So the treatment effect is only being estimated on the intercept. And we're saying students who were in the treatment group on average started 1.54 points lower, okay? So when you think about it like that, that actually probably makes more sense because we're probably not really estimating the model we actually want to estimate here, which is we want, want probably want to look at differences in slope. Did the treatment group progress faster than the non-treatment group for thinking in terms of educational interventions, right? It would make sense that the treatment group would be lower on average to start. Um, also, yes, I'm using arm display here rather than summary M. That's just to get it to fit on the slides. You can use arm display if you want, or you can just use summary to produce the results the same. I think I mentioned that last time, but just to be clear. Okay, other projections. So we have a linear model, right? So this means that those lines that we just saw, we could extend off into negative and positive infinity if we wanted to, right? Any value we want, all we're gonna do to get a prediction for it is just extend that line to whatever it is that we want to do. So we could do something totally crazy like this, where we have wave is from negative 500 to 500. Um, 
and SID is equal to two. And then we have the treatment for zero and one. So we're saying, give me the lines from negative 500 to positive 500 for treatment and control for student two. And we get something that looks like this. So now those lines are so overlapped because the difference between them is small in comparison to negative 500 and 500. And obviously this makes no sense at all. Um, there's no reason that you would ever actually do this. But what I am trying to point out is that once you have those model parameters estimated, you can use them to predict anything. Okay, all you're doing is extending the line. Okay, any questions on any of that part? Okay, we're a quiet group today, but that's okay. Just, just want to make sure we're, we're feeling okay. We're not feeling like super overwhelmed or anything. Or maybe we are and we're just feeling very quiet. <laughs> All right, uncertainty. All right, what to predict. So let's say we want to actually predict what this, what these three students, what their scores would be for time point 10, 11, and 12. Okay, so we have zero to nine. What about 10, 11, and 12? Okay. What we could do is again, create another prediction data frame. Okay, so my convention is generally to call these things print frame. Um, and we have probably, and in many cases, multiple of them. But if I just have one, it's usually print frame. That's just my thing. Okay, so I'm creating a data frame here where I'm saying SID is equal to one to three because we're going to look at the first three students. And I'm going to repeat those each 13 times. Okay, because that's zero to 12. Okay, then for wave, I'm going to. I'm gonna have zero to 12. And then for treatment, I'm gonna go one, zero, one each 13 times, okay? The length of these things can get a little bit confusing and it's kind of hard to work through. And then on the these rep things too, it can be a little confusing. So rep zero to 12 is gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I actually don't even need the rep here. Um, but when I say one to three each, 13 times, this is then going to say one 13 times, two 13 times, three 13 times. Okay. If I didn't say each and I just said 13 times, then it would go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, 13 times. Okay. So it's sort of hard to figure this out sometimes. And I'll show you some alternative ways of creating these later. But this is now the data frame we want. We have SID one, it goes zero to 12 and that person was in treatment one, okay? Then we have SID two, it'll go zero to 12, and that will be a zero for not being in the treatment, and then it'll be SID three, zero to 12, and one, okay? Next, we're gonna install and load a package called Mer Tools. okay? And this is not strictly necessary, but I think this is probably the most straightforward way to do this, okay? So I'll give you a minute if you don't have this package installed because I didn't warn you about it before class, please install this package first. And then give me a thumbs up emoji once you got that or on the screen, whatever. Okay, it looks like we're most of the way there, but I'll wait another few seconds here. All right, I think we're there. Okay, so MerTools. MerTools has this function called predict interval. Okay, and that's what we're going to use to get an interval, an uncertainty interval around our model predictions, okay? So I use predict interval on M, my model. I'm saying new data is equal to pred frame. Okay, so that prediction frame I just created on the last slide. And then the level is equal to 0.95. And you could change that to be 0.8 if you want or 0.99, whatever, right? That's the confidence interval around your model 
based predictions. It will return something that then looks like this. Okay. So it's a little bit difficult to work with. It's not hugely difficult to work with, but it's a little bit difficult just in the fact that it only returns the output. It doesn't give you back anything related to your initial data frame that you had, right? But the number of rows will equal that data frame before. So we can just staple them together, which I'll show in just a second. But what this is going to do is it gives me the model-based prediction, right? The fit. And then it's going to give me the upper and lower bounds of that prediction. Okay, so this is the uncertainty interval for that prediction. So if we want to put them together, I would just use bind underscore calls. Generally, this is a function that I would I would recommend avoiding. Um, it's pretty rare that you're going to want to just take two data sets and just staple them together like that. So bind calls is this way, bind rows is this way, right? That we did before. Bind rows is pretty common, and you will probably do that a lot. Bind calls is not very common, um, and it's pretty dangerous because if you have uh, things that are sorted differently or whatever, then you can bind the columns and then you'll have errors. Okay. So uh, generally, you're going to want to do joins instead, but in this case, we don't even have anything to join on. So we're uh, just going to bind those columns together as long as we didn't sort that pred frame differently or something before this running this code, then it should work. Okay. So here's my SID wave treatment, and then we get our fit upper and lower bounds of that. So then we can use that to create some visualizations. All right. So here's my bind calls, and then I'm putting wave on the x-axis, fit on the y-axis, and then I'm using geom ribbon. Okay. Geom ribbon is what gives you that that ribbon right here. Right. I just have to specify the the lower and upper bounds of that ribbon, which I'm going to say is the lower and upper bounds of the uncertainty, right? And then I'm I'm putting the alpha at 0.4 here, but you could change it to whatever. That makes it see-through, right? Alpha is transparency. And then I'm going to put the line, which is going to be equal to fit, right? And I'm making the color magenta. And then I'm going to facet wrap by SID, OK? So this is pretty nice, because this now gives us the um, basically not just our model predictions, but also some uncertainty around those predictions. OK? In this case, again, because we just have a linear model, our, our uncertainty is pretty much constant. So it's just going to be the same size across all of them, which is not really reflective of reality, because we are probably more certain about these values than we are about 10, 11, 12. Right, but our uncertainty band that we're calculating here is not really going to be able to distinguish between those. Okay. So what's really going on here? I'm not going to go over this too much. Um, you can look here if you want a full description, but basically it's simulation based. Okay, so it's going to essentially um, get a distribution of model parameters by assuming normal distributions. And then it's going to get a distribution of predictions from sampling from those distribution of parameters. And then you get uh, a distribution of model predictions. And so the lower and upper are just the quantiles of that prediction distribution. OK, it's fairly complicated. Um, that's basically it. But it tends to work pretty well. If you look at that link, it walks you through some of the alternative methods and how this method compares. Um, but this is a disclaimer. This is from the LME4 authors, right? They say that there's no option for computing standard errors of predictions because it's difficult to define an efficient method that incorporates uncertainty in the variance parameters. So they recommend using LME4 Bootmer, which I really struggled with. I spent a long time looking into it, and I really struggled with it. So I'll take you through what I found, but it's um, quite complicated, I think. OK, um, so predict interval is basically an approximation of Bootmer. It does the same sort of thing through a simulation based approach rather than through bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is more of the gold standard, but it can take a really long time. And as I'll mention here in a minute, um, I got some really unexpected results when I was setting up the bootstrapping for how I 
thought it made sense and I found other people that were having the same sorts of problems. So, but basically what we do for this seems like it should be pretty straightforward. We just create a function to pull out what we want to have pull out for each bootstrap. Okay. So I have a function, which I'm saying has one argument fit. Okay. And all I'm going to do is say predict from fit where the new data is that pred frame data that I created earlier. Okay. So that's the whole function. It's just going to predict on that data frame. That's it. Okay. Then we're going to use bootmer like this. So we would say bootmer on M where in sim is the number of bootstrap resamples and I'm saying a thousand. You have to specify a function, okay? So I'm saying predfun, the one I showed on the previous slide. Seed is also pretty clear. It's where you're starting in the random number generation process. So you just put a random value there and it will you'll get the same prediction interval each time, okay? So basically, if you don't have this, you could run B, get one prediction interval, run B a second time, and you get very minorly different prediction intervals. Okay. This use.u is the very confusing part to me, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in a minute. But if you do use.u, basically what it's going to do is it's going to assume that your random effects are true. Okay. So you're really only getting bootstrap intervals around your fixed effects. Um, so by default, it comes out as a matrix, which is pretty difficult to work with, not like impossible or anything, but you have a thousand rows and 39 columns. So each row of the, of the matrix is a bootstrap resample. And then the 39 are the 39 predictions that we get from this, right? Because we have three students and we have 13 time points. So that's 39. So we have each row represents a bootstrap resample and each column represents a time point. Okay, so there's lots of ways you could handle this. I wrote a, a big amount of code. Um, I'm not gonna go through it super, super um, in detail, but I will say what I did here is this T transposes it, okay? So it takes it from 1000 rows and 39 columns to 39 rows and 1000 columns, okay? So it just flips the dimensions. And I made that a data frame. Then from there, I created um, a, yeah. I created an SID variable, which is just one to three each 13 times. So as I said, I'll now have 30, 39 rows. So this is defining the students for each of those rows, okay? And then we have a thousand columns for them. And then I'm creating a wave also. Then I can pivot longer that entire data frame where I'm saying anything that starts with V, which is what all of the columns from that start with. It's V1, V2, V3, because we just call it as dot data frame. Those are the default names you get. Okay. And then I'm doing some transformations and things. And then I arrange by SID bootstrap sample and wave. This is what it ends up looking like. Okay. And this is like, I'm not expecting you to necessarily know how to write this code uh, easily, but I'm just sort of walking you through my process. Okay. So then we have the SID of the wave bootstrap sample. So there's going to be a thousand of those, right? For each student. So that's why this tibble is 39,000 rows. Okay. And then we have score, which is their prediction. Okay. Then we can plot like this. So there's multiple ways to do this as well, but I'm going to use everything. And in this case, I'm saying wave and score, but then for geom line, I'm saying group equals bootstrap sample. So I'm getting a different line for every single bootstrap resample, all 1000 of them, okay? And then uh, making the size really small and making them a little bit transparent and making the color corn flower blue. And you can see we get this uncertainty, but this is really just the uncertainty around the um, fixed effect for that student, okay? Which is basically what we want. But you can see these intervals are quite a bit tighter than they were previously, okay? If we wanted ribbons, we could just summarize that data frame to get the quantiles that we want, and then we would get lower and upper bounds. So this is essentially what is happening 
with that in sim one that I was mentioning before. Like the, what we just created, it has a whole distribution it can pull from. And then you're just saying, okay, in this case, I want the 0 0.025 and 0 0.975 quantiles from that distribution. We're going to call those things lower and upper. And then we end up with a data frame like this. And then we just use geom ribbon instead, and we get something that looks like that. Okay. So again, this is not the uncertainty in the overall predictions. It's just an uncertainty of the line. Okay. So the use.u part. If you want to randomly sample from the random effects also, then you use use.u equals false. I used use.u equals true. The reason is because, like others that I found online, I could not get it to be anything other than just not nonsensical. It was every each of those three students had huge intervals and they were identical, essentially. Okay. And I want what I want is to randomly sample from the random effect for that student, right? Which is different than just like it seemed like it was ignoring the random effects altogether. So this is confusing to me, as I say here. Um, you can look here and here for more information. Those are both uh, where I was sort of digging through things as I was trying to figure this out. And uh, that might help you understand more. Honestly, I would probably just stick with predict interval, okay? But I wanted to mention all of this because the LME4 authors specifically warn against, um, you know, or they specifically don't have a method for doing this other than bootstrap resampling. And so that other method, the predict interval method is using simulation and it's supposed to approximate this. One of these, I think it's this one. Um, no, it's not that one. It's uh, back where I was before when I was talking about this. This is a vignette for that prediction interval one. And he goes through, um, the prediction intervals from this model that he's fitting uh, using his method versus different options of that bootmer. So that's helpful, but it was still still quite confusing to me. Okay. So I'd probably just stick with the predict interval, but I want to make sure you're aware of this as well. OK, how are we feeling right now? It's a lot, right? Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so we will um, continue onward because we kind of need to. Um, um, Not sure what you're talking about there, Brock. Oh, your slides are numbered different, but you have bootstrap. I thought it was a new genre of music. Oh, on, instead of bootstrap, I see. Instead of bootstrap, you have boost boost rap or something. I think. Where's that at? Oh, bootstrapping. Yeah, it's boost bootstrapping. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a lot, but let's um let's continue on, and we'll continue to practice with this, all right? But the main point that I'm trying to get at is really, truly, I think, um, doing this sort of work with your models will help you understand the model a lot better, OK? So basically, you have a model. You, it, you estimate some parameters from that model. Um, and lar larger models have lots more parameters, right? And so then you're going to make predictions from that model to help you understand what your model is doing. Okay, that's kind of the point. All right, let's move on to a, a few more complications. Okay, we'll talk about interactions now. Okay, we're gonna create an interaction between treatment and wave, which is actually probably closer to the thing we actually wanna evaluate. Okay, so, Real quick, conceptually, what would that mean? If we estimate an interaction between treatment and wave, I've sort of already mentioned this, but what would that mean conceptually? Uh, 
uh, that there's not a constant effect over time? Mm -hmm. Correct. That's exactly right. So the relation between wave and score is different for each treatment. Okay. So treatment slope might look like this and the control slope might look like this. All right. So this, the steepness of the line is different across treatment groups. Okay. That's what we're going to be estimating. We'll also add in a school level random effect for the intercept. Okay. Just for the intercept though. All right. So for interactions, if you're used to LM, the code for interactions with LMER from LME4 is exactly the same. Okay, so both of these are equivalent. This is saying wave as a fixed effect, treatment as a, a main effect rather, wave and treatment as main effects, and then wave colon treatment is the interaction. Okay, you can also specify it like this, which just expands out into this. So this is saying a main effect for wave, a main effect for treatment, and their interaction. Okay, either of those are equivalent. If you want to add additional levels, it's fairly straightforward. Okay, all we're going to do is just add additional parentheses and specify what those levels are. Okay, so there's sort of two different ways that we can approach this. We can assume your IDs are all unique and then you have implicit nesting. Okay, so for instance, um, I have student one through five in school one. When I get to school two, the first student ID is six, and there is no student one through five in the second school. Okay, that's implicit nesting. If instead I have student one through five in school one, and then I have student one through five in school two, then you have to model it, you have to use your syntax differently. You have to explicitly state the nesting. Okay, I tend to always have unique IDs. And so I tend to not worry about it and I use implicit nesting syntax. Okay, but I'm gonna show you both. So here, and this link will is a blog post. It'll take you through a bunch of different examples. Okay, so here's an implicit nesting example. Okay, I have score that's modeled by a main effect for wave, a main effect for treatment, and their interaction. Okay. And then I'm saying plus the intercept and wave are going to vary randomly across SIDs. And the intercept is going to vary randomly across schools. Okay. And if every SID is unique, this will work. If instead, Every SID is not unique. So we have the same SID repeated across every across multiple schools. So SID one in school one is not the same student as SID one in school two. Okay, if that is the case, then you have to use explicit nesting syntax, which just looks like this. So we have wave varying randomly around SID nested in school. Okay, and then intercept randomly varying across schools. So this is the only difference, right? This part. And if we look between these two, if you look down here, right? I'm pointing at my screen as if you can see that. If you look down here, you can see everything is exactly the same that is estimated, right? So these two formulations are exactly the same when you have implicit nesting. If you do not, then you will need to use explicit nesting or you'll need to make your IDs unique. Okay, does that make sense? So one thing to be um, aware of, this is the code that I almost always use. Okay, I almost always have unique IDs and so I just never, really worry about it. Um, but this is probably safer. Okay. 
because if you happen to have, but it's, they, I guess I say safer, but it's, they do sort of make different assumptions. So if you're using this syntax and let's say you have a student, like you have longitudinal data, you have a student nested in a school and at the second time point, that student moves to a different school, right? If you use this syntax, then that model would treat that student as a different student at those two time points, okay? Whereas this model would treat them as the same student at those two time points. But that's technically a partially cross-classified model. So we'll, we'll talk about that sort of stuff more later too, okay? Questions on any of this? Uh, just a quick question. So would you say that is always better if you uh, we try to have a unique ID for every student? Yes. And if we want the same student, I mean, who moved to new school to be two person, then you, so we specify beforehand with two IDs. Yes. And I don't think... Um, you would generally want to treat the same student as a different student across different time points. You'd still want to treat them as the same student. Um, so, so I, I think this would be better in that case. But if you happen to have repeated IDs across schools where they really are different students, then this one is going to be safer because if you like, let's say. For the most part, you have unique IDs, right? But you have, say, two or three students that happen to have the exact same ID in different schools, but they actually really are different students, right? This syntax would account for that, whereas this one would not, and you'd be treating the same, you'd be treating different students as if they were the same students. So you'd be estimating basically one um, random effect deviation for multiple students. That makes sense. So this is like, to me, I, I tend to use this syntax, the implicit, implicit nesting, but for either one, like the real, I guess, take home message is either can introduce errors depending on what you're doing. I said this one's probably safer because of thinking about the previous situation, um, but then I wasn't thinking about students moving between schools or whatever, which is, is also problematic, right? So in that case, this one's probably safer. So I'm kind of walking back what I said earlier. And the main message I think is you probably really need to get to know your data first and make sure that you don't have things like that going into your model. And if you have explicit nesting, then these two things should result in the same thing. So that is one way you could kind of test it, right? You could fit the model like this, fit the model again like this, and you should get equivalent results if they are truly nested and the IDs are unique. And if they're different, then that might make you go back to your data and dig into it more like, what's going on here? Why are, why are these results different? They shouldn't be. Other questions? Okay. All right, so this is now a three level model. So how does it differ from two level models in terms of our model predictions? Any ideas? If we were gonna make a prediction for a given student by hand, what would we have to do relative to a two level model? Adding random value for the score. Exactly. So you'd have to have the random values for the student added in there, but you would also have to add those random values for the school. Okay. So let's make a prediction for the first student at the fourth time point. Okay. So I'm just doing one time point for one student. Okay. So this is what their data look like. And um, I'm extracting the pieces a little bit differently this time. Um, in part because it's more efficient, but also to show you a different way of getting at the same stuff. Okay, so I'm using fixed F for M1A, that's giving me the fixed effects. And then I'm using RANF 
which is the same thing as those ran underscore vowels from the tidying. Okay, so this just gives me a vector of the fixed effects, and ranf actually gives me a list in return. Okay, and so it gives me a list where it has a uh, data frame for each level of nesting. Okay, so I have an SID data frame and I have a school data frame within that ranf thing. Okay, so this is, I'm saying just for the first student at the fourth time point, the first student is in the first school. Okay, so I can just pull the first row of that data for each of these and I get the, the random um, effects for those. So this school students had on average one point scored on average 1.85 points higher than the overall average, 9.96.8, right? They progressed on average a little bit faster also about 0.2 points per wave faster than the overall average of 0.4, okay? And then for the school, we only have the intercept randomly varying. Oh, this is just for the student. I think I was saying school. Students in this school also started higher. So this student had a higher initial starting point than average and progressed faster than other students on average. And students in that school on average started higher as well. Okay, so now we're going to make predictions for the fourth time point. Okay, so we're going to do it like this. I have notice back here, sorry, um, that I am, I've stored all of these things in elements. So here's fixed, it's all of my fixed effects. So if I say fixed bracket two, I'll get wave, right? If I say fixed bracket four, I'll get this interaction piece, okay? And then this is SID RANFs and this is school RANFs. Okay, so putting it together, we're gonna first predict their intercept, okay? So I'm taking fixed one, the intercept, plus the random effect deviation for the, the student, plus the school random effect, right? All of that is for the, the intercept, okay? So we add all of that. Then we're gonna say plus fixed two, which is my fixed effect for wave, right? Plus the random effect for student two. So that's this part. So I'm adding these two together. Okay. And then I'm going to multiply those by three for the fourth time point, right? Zero, one, two, three. Okay. That adds the fourth time point. Then we're going to add the treatment effect, fix three. I'm just saying times one, because if we look back here, treatment is one. Okay. So we're adding in the treatment effect. And then we have the treatment by wave effect. So notice this is the interaction and I have to multiply that by three because it's the fourth time point here. Okay, so this is a, a lot now at this point, right? And last term, you probably fit models that were very similar to this in complexity, right? A three level model with an interaction. But when we actually break it apart, and try to figure out how this model is working, then it it's kind of difficult, right? It's kind of hard to understand how all of these parameters are coming together to make a prediction for it, an individual student. So this is an effort to walk through it for one time point for one student. And essentially the model is gonna be doing this for all students across all time points, across all schools, okay? So we can confirm by just saying predict M1A where new data is equal to sim longitudinal four, so just the fourth row, and we get 102.5004, 102.5004, okay? All right, um, so now I wanna do something slightly different where I'm going to randomly sample five students in the first four schools, okay? And then we're gonna display the model predictions for those five students across those five schools. And so what I'll do is I'll show the five predictions, the five students in each school and have each school be a different facet, okay? 
So there are lots of ways that you could conceive of randomly sampling five students from each of the first four schools. Okay, there's tons of ways that we could do this. This is the way that I chose to do it, okay? Um, because it's a little bit trickier, I think, than you might otherwise expect because we have the data in this long format, right? So a given SID is repeated like nine times, right, for each time point. So what I'm doing here is I have sim longitudinal and I'm gonna filter where school is in one to four. So th these are my first four schools. And then I'm gonna group by school ID and SID and I'm gonna call this function nest, okay? Um, this is, I'm guessing for most of you, brand new. You've probably not seen this before. It's a sort of strange data format when you, when you first see it, but it's really useful in a lot of different ways. What we end up with is a row for every combination of a given SID and a given school. So every, every SID and school. So basically we have a row for every student and then we have, we're keeping the, the school that they're in there. But then we have this third column called data, which is all the data for that student. Okay, so we're just kind of packaging that, all of that data into this, this one cell, right? This one cell is all the data for that one student. And so that makes our sampling easier to do now. So I have this sample and I'm just gonna group by school and say sample in five. So give me five rows from this data set, this nested data set for each school, okay? And then finally, I can say, okay, now unnest the data and ungroup it. And we end up with data that looks like this, okay? So these are now my five randomly sampled students from each of the first four schools. If, if you didn't totally follow along there, totally fine. This is sort of just a random aside as one way you might do this, okay? But there are plenty of different ways that you could randomly sample students from schools, all right? So now we're gonna make predictions. We're gonna do this just like we did before. We have our sample, we're gonna create a new column called pred, where I predict from M1A, this model I just fit a minute ago, where the new data is SAMP, okay? And we can kind of see we have a pred column over here. And then we're just going to plot it, okay? So I'm, this is super simple, but I'm just saying wave on the x-axis, pred on the y-axis, group is equal to SID. So group means give me a different line for every SID, then just do geom line plus facet wrap by school. And there you go, okay? And what we see here is we have considerably more variance in the intercept than we do in the slope, but you can see that the slopes are different, right? And generally they look like they're kind of converging over time, right, for each of these. Does that make some sense why you might wanna do that? All right, final thing today, we have like 15 more minutes. I know that today has been a lot um, and if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's okay. As you'll see, well, as you probably have seen already, I'm only asking you for the homework to produce one of these plots, and it's pretty simple. It's um, it's much less complicated than some of the stuff I just walked you through. But I wanna make you aware of this and ha have you have the code there. So when you come back to this later, you can use that if you want, okay? All right, marginal effects. So a marginal effect shows the relation between one variable in your data set and the model outcome while averaging over all the other predictors or while holding them constant, okay? And this is a great way to better understand your model. Um, it's per particularly helpful when you have interactions or nonlinear effects, okay? Which we don't really have here, but we do have an interaction. So we'll use it to look at our interaction, all right? Um, so here I'm making the model even slightly more complicated again. So I'm keeping my random effects structure the same as it was, intercept and wave varying by SID, 
and only the intercept varying by school. Okay, but up here, I've just added a couple of additional fixed effects. So I've got group, which is um, low, medium, and high, and then prop low, which is the proportion of students who were low <laughs> in, um, initially or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Oh, oh, I, I think it's the proportion of students in the school who were in the low group, right? So if there were 50 students in the low group in the school and the school had 100 students total, then that would be 0.5. Okay, so this is a school level variable. This is a student level variable. This is a student level variable. This is a time level variable. Okay, but notice within LME4, I don't have to specify levels at all, right? I don't even have to really think about it. All I have to do is make sure my data is structured that way. So if you look at the data closely, um, you will see that prop low only varies by school. So the values do not change in rows within a school. They only change between schools. And similarly, group and treatment vary between students, but not within student, right? A student is either in the treatment group or they're not. Wave varies within student, okay? So every, at the, you know, you have a student ID and then it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, okay? All right, so here's the model. And I can look at this model like this, right? And we can see students started on average with a score of about 97.6. That varied between students with a standard deviation of about nine points and between schools with a devi standard deviation of about 3.4 points, okay? For every wave, students gained on average about 0.4 points which varied between students with a standard deviation of about 0.2, okay? Students in the treatment group started on average about 0.8 points higher. Notice this is flipped now from what we had before. And students in the low group started on average about 4.8 points lower. Students in the medium relative to the high group. Students in the medium group started about 3.6 points lower relative to the high group because the high group is left out here. And then proportion low, um, I would have to look back at how that's coded uh, to interpret that. And then wave treatment is negative. So basically students in the treatment group gained on average about 0.45 points less per wave than students not in the treatment group, okay? All right. So marginal effect, let's look at the relation between wave and score by treatment. Okay, that was our interaction that we that we modeled. So I'm gonna take you through this quickly, um, but you'll have the, the code by hand, and then I'm gonna introduce a package that will basically do it for you. Okay, so this is this gets complicated. I should have shown a different way of doing this, but this gets complicated because of the length of things, all right? So I'm not gonna pay too much attention to that, but basically you need each of these things to end up being the same length. So I'm saying repeat zero to nine twice, right? So it's gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay? Whatever the length of that ends up being, so 20, right? This one, this next one also needs to be 20 or it needs to be one, length 20 or one, okay? And so I'm saying repeat zero and one each 10 times, okay? And then for the group, I'm saying just high. So that's a value of one where the levels are low, medium, and high. And then for prop low, I'm saying give me the mean of the overall prop low, okay? And finally for SID and school, I'm saying negative nine, nine, nine. Those are values that are not real, right? They do not exist in the data. And that's because I, I would want to get these predictions for basically the population level estimates, not for any given student or any given school, which means when these predictions are made, they will be made only using the fixed effects, okay? So um, we have one value for group, 
we have one value for prop low and we have made up SID in school. And then we're going to make predictions for wave and treatment across 10 waves for whether the student is in control or treatment. Okay. All right. So this is what I end up having it look like, right? Zero to nine zeros, zero to nine ones, and then group and prop low and SID in school are all constant. Specifically, SID in school are values that do not exist in the data. All right. Hey, Daniel. Yep. What would, why didn't you put like NA there? I wouldn't have done, I would have just put NAs. Would it be equivalent or would that mess it up? I don't think NAs work. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I always just end up putting negative 999 because my values are negative, never negative. Um, so, but yeah, it is like a little disconcerting because it's like, well, what if I accidentally put a level that's really in my data set? Um, okay. But yeah, that's why, I mean, for me anyway, my, my IDs are ne never negative. So I always just use a negative value. Okay. All right. And then we're going to make predictions. And now I have this one additional argument. So I'm, I have my marginal frame. I'm just saying mutate, create this new prediction from M2. Um, where the new data is marginal frame one, but I have this additional argument, allow.new.levels equals true. And in this case now, SID and school are not levels in my model, right? So by saying allow.new.levels equals true, it's going to say, okay, I'm gonna make these predictions just using the fixed effects, not the random effects, okay? And now I have a data frame like this that gives me the predictions for these different things for wave zero to nine, for treatment zero and one, and for group high, prop low, et cetera. Okay. And then I can make my plot that looks like this, right? So you can see students in the control group made considerably steeper growth than students in the treatment group or treatment group. <laughs> okay. All right, so why do we do this? Um, as your model gets more complicated, specifically with things like interactions and nonlinear effects, then plotting these marginal effects can really help you interpret your model. So seeing that difference is really helpful versus just looking at the number negative 0.45, right? And specifically, if you have multiple interactions or three-way interactions or the, that sort of thing. So um, this is now just doing it again, but looking for all groups, low, medium, and high. And then we can do something that looks like this. Really, the only thing that's changed here is the intercept. Right? The, the intercept value is changing, but these lines are otherwise unchanged. OK, last thing, last five minutes here, we can do this on our own, but we can also use this package called ggfx, which is part of that easy stats. No, it's not. It's by the same author. Um, but so you might have to install this first. But all we do here is we just say gg predict m2 for wave. Okay, that's going to give me the marginal predictions for wave. And then down here, it tells you what it, you, what it set the values as. So treatment is equal to zero, group is equal to high, Prop low is equal to 0.3, and SID is equal to zero population level. And school is equal to zero, that's cut off, but okay. So then we get these predictions, and then we can even plot it right away. And hopefully we even get the uncertainty in the predictions, okay? Which are, is using, I believe, that same method we used before. Notice in this case, though, I'm saying that the thing I want it to plot are both wave and treatment, okay? And then I would pass that to plot. Um, so this is a really nice thing to do just in terms of getting the stuff out there. Honestly, I know it's a little intimidating, but going through this process of creating your own data frame and making the predictions that way, I think will really help you understand your model better. Okay, so the other thing is once you have the data frame, then you have full control over how the plotting looks. So this is a great method for um, you know, 
doing some visual stuff, but it's hard to control this plot from here on out, like the colors and the things. Um, there are some ways you can do that, but uh, we can also look if if we want now for SID equals one and school equals one. So we can look at it, specific values that are in our data set rather than looking at like the population values. So this is for SID one. And then we can look at all categorical groups as well. So here I have wave treatment group for SID one and school one. And so these are like predictions as if that student was in high, low and medium group. Okay. All right, so I know um, that's a lot, um, but hopefully this sort of made sense in terms of like what, why we would do this, what we're trying to do. We're trying to dig into our models to understand how they're making predictions. And I think part of why it's a little overwhelming is just the amount of code becomes a little overwhelming. Um, so, you know, you have the code there now as more of like a reference, but what I'm really trying to get at is just why we would want to do this. And if you wanted to do it, hopefully you could sort of parse through the code. Okay. So next time we are going to talk about variance covariance matrices um, for the random effects. And we'll talk about the Gelman and Hill notation for models in more depth for the first time, finally. Um, and homework one is due. So we'll actually go over homework one. But um, <laughs> it's it's the birth time of my daughter now. So the other <laughs> daughter came in very excited. Um, so homework one is officially due. But uh, if you're not there, if you don't have it done, that's fine. OK, but we'll probably go over homework one. Any questions or anything anybody wants to check in on before we leave for the day? If you're feeling super overwhelmed, please do reach out to me and we can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and kind of go through some of this stuff a little more. All right?